Hello, everyone. I'm Christian Roberts, Director of Education at the Dallas Opera. I'm here with my fabulous colleague and co-host. Quodicia Johnson, Education and Company Culture Manager for the Dallas Opera. And we are coming through again with another episode of Taking the Stage with Christian. And Quo. One of the things we've started doing and one of the things we will continue to do for every episode is a land and people acknowledgement. We do this land and people acknowledgement to acknowledge the fact that there's connections that need to be made. There is opportunity for us to heal the harm. There's opportunity for us to reduce the harm. There's opportunity for us to walk forward together in strength and in truth. And with this, I would like to take the time that we to say that we here in Dallas are on stolen land. We are on the land of the Caddo, of the Wichita, and of the Comanche sovereign nations. Nations that faced policy, nations that faced genocide, nations that faced horrible conditions that forced their removal from their own land so that other people can come in and settle the land. I also want to take the time to acknowledge that people were stolen from their homes and brought here in Dallas and forced to build what we now enjoy as Dallas. I do this again, not to place the blame game, but to acknowledge truth, to acknowledge that those nations are still here, they're still thriving, to acknowledge that the descendants of those enslaved individuals are still here, are still thriving, especially for this particular episode in which we have guests from Prairie View a and University. So with this, I uplift our communities, I uplift our nations, I uplift our stories. And I thank you for joining me for this land and people acknowledgement. And we thank you for joining us for this episode. We are grateful for your continued support, particularly the staff at the Dallas Opera, and of course, our friend and brother, David Lomeli. Hey, David. And we also want to thank our audience. You continue to show up every week um, and continue to send in your questions and talk with us, and we very much appreciate it. So today, we have some heavy hitters with us today. Quo, please, would you like to introduce our guests? Yes, I'm super excited. If y'all cannot already tell, I am honored. I am overjoyed. <laughs> Too many words. To be able to introduce my professors from the Prairie View A&M University, I would like to introduce Dr. Vicki Selden. I would like to introduce Dr. A. Jan Taylor. And I would like to introduce Dr. John Cornelius. And they are joining us um, from their offices and from their spaces in their homes um, near Houston and in Prairie View and University. Fantastic. Welcome, all of you. It is very nice to meet you. I've heard a ton about you. Um, good things, um, like I said before, legendary things. Um, and so I welcome you all today. And thank you so much for spending time with us today. So um, let's, let's talk about a little bit about yourselves. I would like um, our audience to sort of get to know you a little bit. So who would like to go first? I nominate Vicki. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> OK, um, I am originally from Compton, California. I did my undergraduate degree at a small women's college, um, a member of the Claremont Colleges called Scripps College. And my undergrad was a liberal arts music degree, majoring in piano. Uh, then I went to Cincinnati Conservatory of Music and got a master's and spent a couple of years in Ohio. And then came back home, dealt with some family issues, started teaching privately, did a little adjunct college teaching, a lot of freelance performing, and um, through just the grace of God and serendipity and all those wonderful things falling into place, started a doctorate at the University of Michigan um, and finally received my doctorate in the 90s. By that time, actually, I was already teaching at Prairie View. I joined the faculty of Prairie View in 1988, and I've been there ever since, been here ever since. We snap. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We all know uh, Dr. Selden was my piano professor, my teacher, uh, while I was at Prairie A&M University. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Selden. Thank you for having me. All right. Next up. I nominate Jan. Ha. Okay, I'll take it. Hello, everyone. I'm Jan Taylor, A. Jan Taylor. I am a rich. I am currently director of choral activities at Prairie View, and I teach and prepare the music students who are 
or training to be music teachers. Mm -hmm. I'm originally from Houston, Texas. I am um, started out as a pianist growing up in all through high school. And, but when I got to the end of my high school year, I think I was just so um, enamored and uh, I fell in love with choral music when I was in high school. And then I endeavored from that point to become a choir director. So I went to the University of Houston where my uh, mentor, my, my high school choir director had gone to school. I wanted to be just like her. So I kind of followed in her path. And that's how I wound up at the University of Houston majoring in voice, uh, have a degree, a bachelor's degree in uh, vocal music teacher education. And from there, I went to Prairie View A&M University where I received a master's in vocal performance and applied voice. And after teaching a few years in public school and also at the collegiate level at Prairie View, I entered a doctoral program again at the University of Houston. And so I, uh, that's where I earned a doctorate in music, musical arts in choral conducting. And uh, before uh, coming to Prairie View in 1996, I had spent 13 years teaching uh, public school music. I've worked in elementary school, taught general music and choir. I taught middle school choir and piano and high school choir. And so came to Prairie View. And as Dr. Selvin mentioned the word serendipity, I had an, have a very interesting story about how I wound up there too. Maybe we'll get to that. But I'm so, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having us. We all know that we are so proud of Quo and just, you know, it's just an honor to be here. And so for those um, who do not know, um, Dr. Taylor was my PV concert chorale choir director, or choral director, baddest one walking. If you have not been under her baton, then, you know, find a way because it's definitely life-changing. Um, so thank you for joining us, Dr. Taylor. Thank you, Quo. Nice to see you. All right, I'm uh, John Cornelius. I'm a native of Jackson, Mississippi, and a graduate of the Jackson State University. Um, I got my start in music because my father was a minister, a Methodist minister in Mississippi, and had a circuit where he didn't have a piano player. And I said, well, I'll play. And he said, you can't play. And I said, well, give me lessons. And I, he said, okay. And so I did. And six months later, I was playing for the church, and I haven't stopped. Um, I was also a bit of a band geek, started playing the trumpet going into seventh grade and played all the way through my freshman year of college. Yes, I marched in the boom, did all that stuff and ruined my arches and said, you know what? I got a piano scholarship. I'm gonna go over here and sit down. <laughs> so um, I've been doing that, but also um, from my very first piano lesson, my teacher was very old school. So she insisted that I learn how to write music write the notes, write the staffs, draw clefs. That was from the very first lesson. And just, you know, being the kid that I was, uh, I didn't think anything of that. And so each week I would have to write something also. So I always assumed that with piano, you had to play the music, but you also had to write it. And I just didn't ever separate those things. And uh, when I got to Jackson State, I wanted to start a group, but my choir director, the illustrious Robert, Robert Morris, said, fine, you can start your group, but if you're gonna write stuff for them, I have to approve it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that he was doing this, but he was setting me up to learn how to write on deadlines. And so I was very, very fortunate for that. And I finished there with a bachelor's of music in piano performance, went to Washington University in St. Louis and got a master's of music in piano performance, and then worked there for a year and a half as an accompanist on staff, and then wound up moving to San Antonio to work at Fiesta Texas when it was still all live. So I was there for the first three years and heard about the Shepherd School of Music and wound up studying there. And I finished my DMA there in composition. So I find, oh, and I, I had a second master's in composition as well. And finished there and wound up moving to the DC area working for a theater company. And I've been doing musical theater all along and uh, did that for a while. And then I wound up teaching in DC in the public schools at Wilson High School for three years. Uh, left there, moved to Little Rock, taught at Philander Smith for a year, came back to Houston, worked at, Perry, at uh, Texas Southern for a couple of years, and Jan Taylor is the reason that I am here at Prairie View right now. So thank you, Jan. My mother thanks you too. Yeah. <laughs> and so here we are, and uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk with you. And so Dr. Cornelius was I. 
theory and composition teacher, just the kicks and greens. <laughs> <laughs> in short, we are in here surrounded by greatness um, and, and with a vers versatile backgrounds. I always like the audience to get to know folks in that way and to see how, how much the, the music and, and just the arts, how it can bring together people from different places and different stages and how the paths are not all the same. There's no one way to do something. So thank you all for sharing that. It's very much appreciated. Um, so I kind of want to talk a little bit about, um, well, I'm, I'm an education director, right? So, and we're all educators in this room and artists. Um, and so I want to talk about your approach to education and sort of your leadership styles in shaping musical minds um, and students' lives. Uh, we talked about that just a little bit, you know, prior to the show, but I, I, I do want to talk about that. So, um, yeah, can we talk about your approaches uh, in the classroom? Anybody, uh, anybody can start. Sure. When we were actually in the classroom, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a wild ride since March. Mm -hmm. um, but prior to that, in the classroom, um, I found that I rarely sat down. I was usually in motion. Mm -hmm. One, because I felt that if I kept moving, well, I, I learned this when I was teaching high school. If I kept moving, I kept the students on their toes a little bit more. Mm -hmm. If I sat in one spot, they would check out. My students in DC never realized that the configuration of my desks allowed me to see from every angle at all times, no matter where I was in the room. So I could see somebody breaking up the line if they were passing a note they were passing a pencil, if they just put their head down, I could see every angle. So they never could figure that out. But when I started teaching at the collegiate level, I realized that some of those same techniques would work here because for a lot of freshmen, first year of college is like the 13th grade. Mm -hmm. So they're bringing all those habits with them. Even though they're around new people, they're trying to quickly establish relationships and social interactions early on. So mm -hmm. I kind of carried that on. And I am, I am constantly, I try not to give direct answers in the classroom because that's too easy. And what ends up happening is that students, especially in theory, they just wanna know, is this right or is this wrong? And I'll constantly say, possibly, because theory is full of possibilities. And if I just give you a simple, I mean, there's certain things that are basic, a triad is a triad. But what kind of triad is it? You know, those kind of things come with more variabilities, mm -hmm. but I want them to do some of the work and spend some time learning how to search out the answer mm -hmm. because I find that that makes it stick better and then they can carry it forward. But if I just simply give them the answer, they're just going to just throw it right back at me the way I said it. And then mm -hmm. 10 minutes later, it's gone. So there's that. <laughs> That's real. That's real. All right. Anybody else? That's that's fantastic. Well, since I've been teaching piano a uh, part of the day and I started with music history and I teach both, let me come from both standpoints. Um, my approach is to try and nudge, force, cajole, whatever I need to do students to make connections between the courses that they take. Yes. Um, you know, they take have to take six semesters of theory and then they take actually three semesters of music history if you count music lit. And then there's sight singing and then there's a, their applied lessons and then there's the ensembles. There's all these things that they do. But I find the hardest job is for students to bring the skills that they're learning in one thing that are necessary and vital skills into the other thing. For instance, in piano, I'm always talking about analysis and theory. Yes. And I told the student yesterday, I said, I haven't sat in a theory class in 42 years. It's fresh for you. You're in a theory, you're in analysis right now. You need to bring those skills that Dr. Cornelius is teaching you and look at this piece of music because it'll be so, you'll learn it so much faster. Mm -hmm. So that's one of my my pet peeves and my mantras, you know, synthesis, bring it all together. It's all a continuum. They're not separate silos, even though we are forced to teach them that way. It all works together. And the more you can bring the elements together, 
the deeper your musicianship, the more you really understand and then can can emote. So. Ooh, ooh that's a word. <laughs> I'm selecting them. I'm going to wait, but ooh, ooh. All right, Dr. Taylor. All right, yeah, that is, absolutely is a word. Synthesis, that's my yes, word. And, and, and transfer, that's my, um, that's, those are my words in choir. Because, because we're a performing ensemble, I mean, you've got to have all of those things come together to inform your performance. You got to know the history, background. Uh, you need to know style. Uh, because when we sing a Bach Baroque piece, it's going to be totally different from uh, when we sing a Mendelssohn piece, even though Mendelssohn did reach back and, you know, to those older uh, old styles. But so, you know, being familiar with composer style uh, to inform our performance, yes. But my biggest, uh, and then, of course, to build musicianship. I think that is so mm -hmm. important because when we talk about uh, stigmas, uh, singers, <laughs> are kind of stigmatized for not being the best musician. So I really hone in on that. We will read this and uh, we will develop those skills. And uh, so, you know, in high school, we do sight read. I mean, you know, just like they come to us from high school programs doing uh, sight reading, we have our sight reading too in, in university choir. And, um, you know, so building musicianship skills and uh, then transferring all of the, you know, uh, from all of the uh, areas of study that they, uh, and the subjects that they study in music. And then my biggest thing, next biggest thing is all about exposure and experience. Uh, it is so important that our students uh, not be uh, isolated and in a, in a vacuum, just in our choir room and our, our classrooms here at Prairie View, it's important for us to get out. So we do field trips, we go to the opera, we go to the symphony, we do lots of collaborations. I think it is so uh, important for our choir to perform with other choirs. Uh, it exposes us to, you know, what everyone else is out there doing. We get to do, uh, perform with large orchestras. I mean, we've done, um, we, have, we have done the Mahler, uh, you know, yes. Symphony of a Thousand with the Houston Symphony. We have done uh, William Grant Stills and they lynched him on a tree. We have yes. done uh, Coleridge Taylor's um, Hiawatha song with large orchestra yes. and collaborating with uh, groups like that. So exposure in terms of performance, exposure in terms of literature and repertoire yes. and a variety of it. So, you know, that's, that's my big deal with, uh, at least with the performing ensembles. Ooh, we yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Kapayo. laughs> so if you did not know um why I have such love for these three amazing individuals, like this is just like 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 tip, like that much, just and it's so so much richer, right? Just in these few moments that we've had with them. What we always want to be mindful of is the ways in which we can take these lessons and apply them, right? In the arts, to, to apply them in arts organizations and many of our viewers in opera. Um, so I'm gonna walk through, I'm gonna walk through all of that. And Dr. Cornelia started with the activation of imagination, the activation mm -hmm. of understanding what you are doing and knowing that it's not for people to give you the answers. You need to understand what is happening so that you can create your own answers. People will not give you the answers. Organizations, the pandemic, people will not give you the answers. You have to understand what the triad is, and then you have to understand what that structure is. Then you have to understand how it applies to the work that you're doing. So with that, in the same sense of possibly, <laughs> yeah, in the same sense of this is for you to figure out, but this is for you to figure out because you have the tools necessary That's to understand it. what you're doing so that you can reshape it any way necessary for what works for you. And then moving into that synthesis, moving into understanding how it all relates. What we're doing in the arts is not in a silo. What we're doing in our organizations is not in a silo. What is happening within our different departments in our organizations, they are not siloed. All of these things are cohesive and it is important that we understand how they connect to each other, how we connect to the community, how we connect to the artists, how we connect to the staff, how we connect to the field. All of those things are necessary in what we're doing 
and then the exposure and the experience oh my goodness <laughs> So making sure that as we collaborate, because that is what is necessary with one another, we are also being responsible with the resources that we have. And then we're also being responsible for the expansion of the imagination. And I used to say so often in having my minor in business, they would always talk about teamwork in business. And I'm like, y'all need to go join choir because yep. y'all don't know how to work with each other. No. <laughs> I have no idea. You know how to, you cannot not do your part. Like Dr. Taylor hears you. <laughs> what do you do it? This entire section is depending on you and you are one note within this beautiful tapestry of dynamic colors, this dynamic stories, dynamic music, um, this very beautiful way in which we all connect to each other. So it's necessary that we're not in silos and that we're not just looking for answers, but that we're doing the work and then we're reaping the benefits of it together because that's what's necessary. So that's what I heard from all of <laughs> No, I, I think you covered it re really, really well. And it most definitely can, can, can um, fit with where we are. I mean, we are, we are in the business of making music and creating art and an opera and opera encompasses all of the art forms. Mm -hmm. So why on earth wouldn't you want to be, have that synthesis? Like Dr. Taylor said, it's something that we already know how to do. We already know how to do. We have to bring all of these things together. So, I mean, what, that, that applies to even now pivoting during a pandemic. Um, and speaking of piv pivoting during the pandemic, um, let's talk a little bit about what's happening on, on campus right now, because I'm actually curious to see how you all are handling this right now. Like Dr. C says, it's been a wild ride. Um, we started actually this process back in March and it was basically, okay, uh, next week you all need to go home and you need to finish the semester from home. And Zoom, we've got Zoom installed, so just figure it out. And hmm. that's what we did. So um, I know Dr. C and I had the same experience. We had lots of lessons where we could hear maybe every four notes or so. <laughs> over a zoom call and if they started playing too fast you might you forget it forget it and cats would be in the room dogs would be in the room parents would be in the room it was just uh, my favorite is one of my piano majors she doesn't have her own instrument what she had she finally found one of her old keyboards which only had a range of maybe 40 notes and she was sitting on the floor of her bedroom playing it during one of our lessons. Mm -hmm. I was like, yes, this is where we are right now, but mm -hmm. we're just gonna go with it because this is where we are and this is what we gotta do. Yep. This too shall pass, so let's just get through this. But it's been wild. Yeah, I had one student who literally was having to call neighbors and friends and see if he could go by the church to set up his laptop and then try to have a lesson that way mm -hmm. and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't quite mesh we had one lesson that was interrupted once because the neighbor's house he was in um there was a small fire in the kitchen <laughs> wow it's like we'll just That's pick small. this up next week <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah those those are the kind of things that were really challenging for me because i teach sophomore theory there's a big exam toward the end of the semester, yeah. which, you know, I have it in a very nice format printed. Well, I couldn't put it online because they have to write. And you can't depend on students having a tablet that has a stylus that they can actually write on a document. Yeah. So I had to rethink the methodology of that test. And it's supposed mm -hmm. to be a comprehensive test from theory one through theory four. And when I tell you that I spent three weeks trying to come up with the right kinds of questions so that I could know for sure that they understood the process that went into uncovering the answer and still having to put it in some kind of multiple choice format and not just give it away. Mm -hmm. When I tell you I was racking my brains, just going, ah. <laughs> then there was also all of our tutorial sessions for students who were preparing for certification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that went over into, that's when it was starting to get out of hand because some, our work day stopped being Monday through Friday, our work week stopped being Monday through Friday, and it was tipping over into Saturday and the occasional mm -hmm. Sunday. Yeah. And at one point, I just forgot what day it was. Yeah. 
I mean, it was just nonstop. And then you have people scheduling Zoom meetings. It's like, y'all, <laughs> do you understand that it is after five o'clock somewhere in the world? <laughs> I need a break. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we've been on this huge learning curve. Oh, and in the middle of that, the university decided to switch our formatting our programs. So we went from um, Blackboard, no, we went from Moodle to Canvas, mm -hmm. which meant that we all had to be retrained over the summer. Yeah. And I love it. Yeah. And let me piggyback on that. Some of the retraining, though very well thought out, was not exactly the retraining that we actually needed in some mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. Because when we got back in the classroom with all the new equipment they put in there, the training we really needed was to have a couple days in our classrooms so to we practice. could get used to using the equipment mm -hmm. because I mean those couple and then the first day of classes remember this Dr. C Zoom gave up. Gave, gave, yeah. gave up it just said no not doing it that not was today fun. not today <laughs> yeah, not today said, Zoom said not today that was fun mm-hmm but yeah. it's like going hiking and not bringing any matches. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So it was, uh, uh, and, you know, I won't take a whole lot more time uh, because they've capsulized uh, everything. But, you know, um, for me, it was just having to, a, a total change in mindset. Mm -hmm. There's no way I could do choir the way normal choirs normally done. You just can't. You know, we know that singing in choir is a super spreader event for one. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, so couldn't have too many people in, in, a, in a room face to face. It doesn't really, yeah, I had to figure out how to keep my group engaged, my students engaged with each other, because singing is a community activity. Mm. You know, we, we're all choirs are kumbaya, you know? <laughs> we, and so if we can't see each other, can't, you know, be close to each other and sing and get all the feels, you know, that's a huge thing that's missing. You know, that, that's a big part of what, what we do. So, you know, I've had to switch to uh, Zoom and, you know, just made it work the best that we can. I figured out platforms to, you know, have ways to uh, have rehearsal online to, you know, unmute people and have them demonstrate, send recordings in to me and, and things like that. I mean, we're, we're making it work. Mm -hmm. And I have gone to camps and we've done a couple of face-to-face uh, -face, and I tell you when that was like uh, old home, you know, mm -hmm. coming, you know, it's, it just, it just brought home more the fact, you know, how much we missed being together. Yes. So, you know, the, that's choir. And then my other classes, I also teach choral conducting. I'm able to manage that online. Okay. Uh, and my uh, other classes. But, uh, you know, we, the biggest, you know, thing, the, the point I'm trying to make is we just had to rethink everything, throw it in a, throw it in a bowl, stir it up, redo it. I mean, you know, just put the puzzles back together as best that we could. So we're managing, it's not the best, but we're managing. Mm -hmm. Can I make one, one comment of, about what we've all said? There's one thing that I worry about right now is that the mentoring that we do some of that mentoring is because you see somebody's face and you see something in their face, either joyful or an issue that they're having. And then you pull them aside and say, what's going on? Or you say something like, have you ever thought of doing such and such? You seem like you're interested in such and such. You might want to explore this. That mentoring, that connection, a lot of that is lost right now. Mm -hmm. And I worry about the quiet ones the ones that don't ask any questions because right now at this point of the semester nobody's asking any questions it's radio silence on zoom i keep going do you understand are there any questions and it's just silent they are so over it so i i worry a little and i i think that's completely valid um i've, I've heard more than one one educator say that to me um i and and to to your point about um finding different ways to engage and mixing stuff in a bowl. People are literally experimenting with everything right now, trying to figure out how to continue to make those kind of connections. So I'm glad that somebody on the college level has said that as well, because we've heard the high schoolers talking about it, elementary and middle schools. And the fact that 
people who we consider adults, you know, when you're in college, you are considered adults, they still long for that connection that music can bring and that music making can bring together. Absolutely. So that is, that is huge. And I want to commend you all uh, for what you're doing right now, because I know it's not easy out there right now. So we very much appreciate it. Um, and of course, we will, we will try to back you and support in, in any way that we can. Um, <laughs> just, just, just call Qua and you'll find me. Uh, <laughs> and so thank you so much for sharing in the ways that you focus on keep going, right? Because we don't have the option to stop. We had you find Dr. Tate, work it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> work it out, um, which is something that I personally learn in mentor or being a mentee of all three of you and just having the experience at being at a historically black university and being within the HBCU circuit. So can you kind of share with everyone who does not know just the importance, the magnitude, the power of the HBCU circuit? Well, let me go first because I do have to go and also because my experience is slightly different because I didn't get any of my degrees from an HBCU, but I've taught in one for almost all of my academic life. Um, the historically black college and university is a place where students who have all the potential in the world that has gone in a lot of cases unrecognized even within themselves mm -hmm. can under the right circumstances and with the right hard work and with good teaching, they can start to realize the great potential that is in them. That in other kinds of academic spaces, it might still go unrecognized and mm -hmm. undeveloped for various reasons, for racial reasons, for economic reasons, mm -hmm. for the student is too shy and reserved and never says anything and nobody notices who they are reasons. I mean, it's a myriad of reasons, but HBCUs, I've seen it more often than not. You see lights go on and you see possibilities start to occur to the student themselves. Sometimes we see it in them and they don't see it in themselves, but, and I've, I've experienced this more often than not, when I was behind the piano accompanying someone, coaching and preparing someone for a recital, you can hear, you can see that they're starting to get it. Um, and things are starting to blossom. And those are such treasured moments. And the HBCU experience gives students opportunities for that, that they wouldn't, they wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Because on paper, um, it doesn't look like they're at that level, whatever that level is deemed to be. But, you know, we give people a chance to develop themselves from where they are and see how far they can go. That's fantastic. And, and, and speaking of uh, playing for students and recitals, Dr. Selden has to leave us now to do that very thing. I am. <laughs> We've got so, <laughs> four recitals this semester, Dr. C, something like that. There may be five. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's a long so, story. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We, we don't want to keep you. Okay. We don't want to keep you. We know you have to go to work, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all. Um, I look forward to hearing the rest of the, the talk. Absolutely. All right. See you. Thank appreciate you. Bye bye. Toy, toy, toy. <laughs> So I kind of want to continue in this, this conversation, um, just of what Dr. Selden said about the HBCU experience, because very often in the opera field, and even right now in the arts industry period, there's a conversation going on about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how we can recruit better, um, how do we recruit you know, people of color, and that's, in, and that's even in the corporate world. And I have been in meetings, even with meetings with that, where Quo has suggested, have you, have you tried going to HBCUs? <laughs> And then there's a deer in the headlights look. So I, I would like the, the audience to get an understanding. I think Dr. Southern set us up beautifully um, about helping people realize a potential that might've got lost in another, another uh, type of academic environment. Um, what else um, can, can people do? And absolutely, there's so often where students who do have that potential, but kind of need, I would not say need more than others, 
but a matter of equity and what it means to be fair and what it means to kind of jettison ourselves from expectations that do not serve us, that do not serve the whole of us as we've been talking about on the show. So I so appreciate Dr. Selden talking about that potential and what it's like, especially in being in her studio at the piano, being in music history and seeing how everybody responds in that way to that additional, hey, have you considered this, right? So I'd like to kind of turn it over to the other professors to talk about your experiences kind of as educators, as well as students and what that means for HBCUs so that others have an idea of what this means and why it's so grand. Yeah. Well, as uh, Dr. Selden already mentioned, uh, you know, the students um, get uh, the personal attention. I mean, we, we notice them, we pay attention. And when we see things, we act on it. Uh, and just by, and just so you'll know, the three professors that you have on today, Dr. Selden, Dr. Cornelius and I worked together and have for years and we discussed the students. Have you noticed that so-and-so mm -hmm. um, was not here or so-and-so is very quiet or did you hear that voice? Let's see what we can do to encourage so-and-so. Uh, Dr. Dr. C um, mm -hmm. noticed that there was a particular student who had some skills but who kind of laid back all the time. Dr. C put that student in front of the ensemble that played for a musical and said, you will conduct this musical. He's done that a couple of times. And the student is like, uh, what? Yeah, yeah, you have the ability, you can do this. Here, here's the score. Go in there and work with Dr. Taylor with conducting and you will do it. And students will tell you that there's story after story after story like that. Mm -hmm and HBCUs. I mean, we see the potential and we will push, you know, and help the students see their potential. And I think that there are some things, uh, and I'll just say this too, there's some uh, cultural awareness and some things that we don't have to wade through. Ooh, ooh. There are just some, uh, some nuances and things that we just know. And so we don't have that barrier. We just have that kind of connection. And we, we know, you know, uh, what, you know, what some of these kids are probably facing and, and we can just hone in on that. We won't have to even, you know, have any kind of psycholo psychological analysis about it. We just know mm. cultural things that we, you know, we, we're aware of. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I think that, you know, connecting with the students, we, we just have that in, in, at HBCUs and particularly at Prairie View. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'm, I'm always not so much surprised by now, but I'm always frustrated by it is there tends to be an over underestimation of what's, what's possible at Prairie View and most HBCUs. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean, there's a presumption that the education, the quality of teaching, the level of the students' capabilities tends to be lower than everywhere else. That's the assumption. And unfortunately, that assumption is what becomes the prevailing attitude. And so people will see Prairie View on a transcript and they make assumptions about how you've been taught, what you've been taught, mm -hmm. who you've been taught by, without looking at biographies, without looking at, oh, well, I've, I've never heard of so-and-so, or I've never heard of such and such. Um, well, just because you haven't heard of them doesn't mean they don't exist. You oh, oh. Heard of them. <laughs> um, what most people don't know is that when I was studying composition, my uh, contemporary counterpoint teacher studied with Nadia Boulanger. Hmm. So hmm. I'm actually of that legacy. Right. But you wouldn't know it just by looking at me. You'd have to actually look at my bio. To see that. Or actually, how about just look at some of my compositions? And right. Wow, there's a lot of counterpoint here. Where is that coming from? So, you know? Um, you know, do some research. I mean, that's a that's a novel concept. You would think, but also it, it's also a matter of, you know, why don't people come looking at HBCUs when they're looking for graduate students? Right, right. You know, I I know people that go on recruiting jags for grad students, and they don't just go to TMEA; they actually go to the schools. Yeah, they don't come here. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we, they catch somebody at Nats. Oh, mm. maybe, maybe. And that's, that's not always an, a given. That's sort of a, oh, 
we hadn't heard of you before. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. But it, it goes further, it goes deeper than that because I also do a lot of work in musical theater. Um, and so one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, a lot of theater companies won't do a quote unquote black show because they swear they can't find a cast. Mm. You got six million people in the Houston area. You mean you can't you can't find twenty black people? Huh. Really? Where are you looking? <laughs> you know, so I mean, it's, it's that kind of like I kid you not. A company here um, was had scheduled the color purple for their season. They mm. were bringing a tour in, and they were shocked because so many black people showed up to see the show. Mm -hmm. And I said. Well, you know, we really weren't expecting this kind of audience for an urban show. Urban show? The Color Purple? Isn't that set in rural South Carolina or North Carolina? I mean, it's all country. But, oh, you mean the audience. I, okay. You meant black. Oh, yeah, you meant yeah. black. Like, no, Just say what gotta, you meant. We got to drop the euphemisms. The yes, euphemisms sir. are not helpful because they end up pigeonholing not just your cast, yeah. Not just your creative team. If God willing, you actually hire black people for your creative team, uh, but you also pigeonhole the audience, mm -hmm. as if, and the expectations for the audience get narrowed. You know, and that gets also frustrating because when I look at the state of contemporary lyric theater, one of the things that I notice is that if there is a black show that's going to be done, especially in the opera house, it's going to be porgy. Yes. And it pretty much stops right there. Or if it's a contemporary piece, it's all about black trauma. And I promise you, we don't sit around every day talking about how hard it is to be black. We got other things to do, like pay the bills, make sure we got food to eat, make sure the car note is paid, make sure that we got all this other stuff. We live lives. You know, we're, we we fall in love. You know, we fall in love. We have families. Like right. we've said where, this so many times on the show. Where Thank the stories you. of joy. Where are the joy, the stories of aspiration and inspiration. Mm -hmm. Where where's that 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 conversation about who gets the rights to the air property? Because that's an interesting story, I think, especially in in, in the black the black uh, the telling of our stories here in this, in this country. Where are those stories? Because then that becomes not about being black, but it's all about who gets the power right. in the family. That to me is so much more interesting than just dealing with okay, who got shot today. Mm. <sighs> That just gets old. It gets old real fast. So, but I think what I'm really talking about is expectation mm -hmm. and limiting of expectations. And it, and just just to be clear and be fair, we can't lay the blame on one table without mm -hmm. spreading blame to the rest of the tables in the room, because we do it to ourselves too. Because I've heard black people who've never been to an HBCU tell tell me, "Well, I'm not sending my kid to an HBCU. I don't want them to be limited." Right. Um, what do you mean limited? Well, when I, I went to an HBCU and we had an opera company in our in our department. It's called Opera South. Mm -hmm. And they were active for more than 30 years. So we got a chance to be on stage. We had students that had a chance to work on roles before they left their undergraduate years. You know, I got a chance to actually work as a librarian for the orchestra and just understand mm -hmm. how you put a book together. Those kind of things are not random. I right. mean, that's really specific. Um, but to hear television, you know, the only thing we do is, you know, the band's a human jukebox and the choir is just going to get out there and sing a little R&B gospel and then go sit down. Yeah, and that is the expectation. And it is all about our percep perception and why, because as you've already mentioned, uh, uh, how many people have actually uh, researched to see who some of the people who are out doing wonderful things, who are the ones that come from HBCUs? Where do mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know, just even, you know, just let's start with Quo. You know, look at what she's doing, mm -hmm. you know? And we we kind of know how she kind of she got nudged into that oh, area. Yeah. <laughs> We're just, yeah. We know how you got there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and how you got encouraged. We knew you win, you know? And um, you know, and then come to our campuses. Notice uh, who the people are who come from our from HBCUs and what they are doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have uh, people who have gone on to get PhDs. We have people teaching at the collegiate level. We have professional sing singers and performers mm -hmm. out here in the world that came right from Hobart Taylor, Texas. 
you know? Right. So, uh, and then, um, and, and, I, and I go out, I mean, I've, I've taken my choir lots of places and the perception, I, sometimes my jaw drops when I get questions like, or, or comments like, oh, how did, you, you guys are doing the Dvorak um, biblical songs or what is that piece? Or, wow, you can sing in Russian? You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, um, so per perception, you know, come and see what we do. And, and I don't know, um, you know, do your research, do your research. you know? Yeah. One of my classmates at Jackson State um, was a theater major, but he minored in voice and sang in the choir. He went on to become the head of fine arts for the Cleveland Independent School District. And he now runs Karumba House, which is the oldest black theater company continuously running in the United States. But what most people don't know is that his first cousin is Grace Bunbury. Hmm. Come on. And see, that, that's, and that's, that's what I'm talking about right there. And that's exactly what I wanted you all to speak on because me, I'm the product of two people who went to an HBCU. So I know what they can do, okay? I got a father that has degrees in, in, in math and science. And my mother has, well, well, before she stopped, well, actually, I think I stopped her from going back and finishing <laughs> my arrival, but she was doing English and history. And I can tell you now that what when whenever I hear people say, well, the well, the educational quality might not be as yeah. up as stuff, I'm looking at them like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Because I know better than that. You know, and I know better than that because I work with someone every single day that I know better than that. I'm friends with people who are doing huge things, who've gone off to do. I mean, vice president elect. Hello. <laughs> HBCU. And so in speaking of it, like as, as a student, as someone who was kind of shaped in this beautiful environment in which people are not questioning your ability because of the color of your skin, like we're going to be honest about it. People are not questioning who you are. You're not the person who adds diversity into the room, right? You're not that part of it. You are there because you're a student. You're there because you are a mind to be shaped, to to extend beyond, to connect to other minds. You are there because there are people who are invested in what you do. And then on top of that, you are on a place, you are on land where people fought, where people died so that you'd have the opportunity to do that. There is this richness and legacy that comes with historically black colleges and universities that is extremely unique in this nation and that mm -hmm. people would not allow black people, we're gonna talk about it, to study that's how ridiculous it was right mm -hmm. and as we look at the history that has taken place as we look at that legacy as we look at the number of graduates who have come out of so many of these beautiful places and the power that comes out of these places from these graduates we want to be mindful of why we are questioning whether or not the education is of a particular quality yeah. where do you get that from based on what what's the root Based on what? It's, What's it's, the it's root? Based on the, on the legacies of American history. That's yeah. it. It goes right. But here's right. an interesting it's, thing, and I'm gonna I'm gonna actually quote the president of of uh, uh, Morehouse. HBCUs have never discriminated. Nope. We have always been open to everybody. Yep. In fact, people are shocked when they find out we've had music majors of every stripe and hue. Mm -hmm. That's not new. And yes, they come and they get a black experience because that is the culture of this place. Now, what does that mean? It means that you're getting a rounder picture of the world. You're not seeing it through a single lens. You're seeing it through a, through a multiplicity of lenses. Yes. And they leave here with a whole nother concept of how the world works. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And of possibility, of opportunity, Yep. I recall what does it mean to see five, six, seven hundred black men graduate, engineering, oh, music, yeah. math, educators, all of them. And you know they, they used to they used to do the this way, <laughs> like back and mm -hmm. forth. Especially shout out to education um, and engineering. Just what does it mean to be in an environment where you see those things and you know that it is a possibility, and not just a possibility. You know it to be fact. You know it to be true because here I am, right? And so as we go through the process in our organizations of trying to 
make sure that we are racially diverse, that we have diverse experiences. The assumption or the excuse, which is what it is, that there is no talent is no longer acceptable at all. Mm -hmm. HBCUs have been producing amazing talent for over a century. So we wanna be mindful of what it means when we put in the effort, the true effort, or when we also acknowledge with humility when we are not the ones to make that connection. So then we move aside and we share space with others so that those authentic connections can happen and so that they can take place. It is not enough to just say, oh, I can't find them. And it's not enough to assume that people need to request your approval for anything. So we wanna be mindful of that. We've had guests before say that opera does not belong to just one person. The arts does not belong to just one group, one yep. culture. We all share in this and it's going to happen whether you approve of it or not. So as we are going through this process of extending that imagination, as we're going through this process of synthesis and of collaboration, we wanna be mindful that it's not our power, or our approval to extend to others. HBCUs don't need your approval. <laughs> Let me just say also yeah. that for, for institutions that are presenting the arts, mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you're looking for entry-level positions, expand your field of search. Yes. Because in my experience in the arts, nobody walks in knowing how to do the job. Everybody has to start with training because you can prepare through a, a degree program. When you mm -hmm. hit the ground running, there is nothing that's gonna prepare you for, we gotta have all of these copies done before the first rehearsal. Okay, nothing prepares you for that. Nothing prepares you for the break room. Nothing prepares mm -hmm. you for what it's like to have that maniacal maestro who's a maniac to everybody. Doesn't really mm -hmm. matter, it's because you breathe in the same air, they're breathing. Nothing to prepare <laughs> you for that, right? So if you're going to be casting a wide net, truly cast a wide net. Mm -hmm. Look for that energy that could be from a space you hadn't visited before, but might be somebody who is already vibrantly alive and can really bring something imaginative and creative to that position that you're looking for. Yes. Sometimes the safe choice is not always the best choice. Yeah. That's the absolute truth. That's the absolute truth. truth. Um, and as we say all the time on this show, it's going to require something that looks and feel different. It's going to require recruiting methods that look and feel different. Um, it's going to require business practices that we that don't work <laughs> to change. Um, that's what it's going to take. Well, you know, cool. So, I think I talked to you once about you know how many arts organizations say, okay, well, we're going to have an event or we're gonna do this program and it's gonna be for mm -hmm. this underserved community. Mm -hmm. And then they end up with disappointing results because people don't come or they don't hear about it or they don't come because they don't hear about it. Um, and I think one of the best ways of getting around that is instead of you coming and just dropping something on somebody, it's like showing up at somebody's house with a pie, but you don't realize they don't like yeah. you there. <laughs> And you didn't bother to ask before you made the pie, and then you upset because they don't want to eat it. Well, and in fact, they wanted you to show up with bacon. <laughs> you know, they could they could be allergic to blueberries, but you didn't bother to ask. So, you know, it's that collaboration. Of, uh, what are you interested in? What would you like to see? What would you like to hear? It might not look and sound like the traditional opera that we're expecting. But that doesn't make it a bad thing. It just makes it a product of now. But if we go back and actually look at the canon, the operas that we revere as being the legendary operas sounded like their time. Yeah. They were the contemporary theater of their day. Now we've made the museum piece, museum pieces, but you know, why not refresh the well, so to speak? Expand the well. Maybe we need to tap into the aqueduct. And really get well, down there. To to, <laughs> to your there. point, many of the pieces that 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 um, we keep in the canon right now that are um, considered like the top ten hits were operas that pushed the boundaries exactly. of what was considered the normal. 
the norm. Like it, they pushed the boundaries. Um, when when Tosca first came out, there was a review that said it sounded like three years, th three three hours of noise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you, but we but we'll put a Tosca up in a, in a flash because it's beautiful. So I I you know right. so even if you do get some pushback, understand that that comes with the territory of doing something new as well. You know, when Puccini was laying out all those plain augmented chords and those that yes. series of diminished seven chords and people were going like, oh my God, it's too much, yeah. <laughs> too much. My ears are bleeding. Yeah. And now we're waiting for it. Yeah, it is. I mean, come on. Yeah. It's just yeah. beautiful and rich, yeah. Right, yes. exactly. It's a, if you're gonna really present the finest of what all there is, especially with opera, and opera's supposed to be the height of what refinement is. Okay, well, who determines what that refinement is come on. on this particular topic? In this particular setting, you know, you look at uh, Girl of the Golden West. Puccini didn't know the first thing about the West or silver mining or gold. It didn't stop him from writing the piece, did it? Mm. So, if you're going to push boundaries, really push that boundary and start talking to your community and asking them, what do you think this could be? Mm. How about we approach Ooh. this in a different way? Yeah, you know? and man, and, and and rather than appropriate. Because John and I have both been on um, so-called diversity uh, committees on mm -hmm. the major performing arts, mm -hmm. you know, your counterpoint parts here, uh, where you know we were asked mm -hmm. to put things together, and then you know what we presented um, did not fit what they had in their mind, so they kind of appropriated what they thought it should be, and it just it didn't work. It didn't work. Mm. Yeah. So we we do need to collaborate and you know and be open and honest about what um, yeah. you know the types of things that that would work. And I mean, if you truly want diversity, and it's our responsibility as responsible storytellers. It's some of the things that we're working on right now, especially in education. It's not enough for us to entertain ourselves by depicting someone else's life. Yeah, it's not enough, especially when we mm -hmm. have the opportunity to be in a space where we create a platform where people can tell their own stories. We yeah. do not, we're mm -hmm. not entitled to everybody's stories. We're not entitled to tell everybody's story any way we want and then expect people to show up to watch it. <laughs> right, Phil Chan has yeah. talked about that as well. We've talked about that in several spaces and that as responsible storytellers and then as organizations steeped in storytelling, especially in opera, it is necessary that we be authentic in that. And that means that there is a learning process. There's a connection that has to happen as we learn, as we unlearn. And then as we, again, move aside or share space or step up or move forward so that we can be able to tell those stories in a way that is authentic, in a way that is real, in a way that allows us to expand who we are in the space that we hold for other people. Yeah. I, um, something that you just said about, about serving on committees and then you, know, you said, this is what you should do. And, and then they didn't do it. And I just want to point out, you know, excuses for doing that are no longer valid either. Yep. They're no longer acceptable either. Yep. Um, what's the point of having somebody uh, and asking for their, their, their advice and asking for them to work with you on something for you just not to take it? So yep. we need to be very careful about that, particularly in a time where these issues are arising and on fire in the arts world right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I would suggest that this time you listen, organizations. You know, and I'm preaching to myself too. Mm -hmm. All right, opera is not exempt <laughs> from these problems. So, um, I guess in the our, our next few minutes, because I know we we could we could talk about all of this all day long. I think at some point we're going to have to have them back. Absolutely, because <laughs> this is just this is too this is too good. Um, I kind of want to get into sort of some of the final thoughts you have when it comes to engaging. Um, not with ju not just engaging with HBCUs, um, period, but what it takes to engage with um, uh, the students yeah. who come out of HBCUs. What sort of advice do you have for, and I'm talking about graduate programs that the students may transfer into to, to uh, opera companies where they may be a young artist, anything like that when they go audition and like Dr. Cornelius pointed out, they look down at the paper and say, well, I've never heard of this. You know, what, what words do you have? What sort of words of wisdom can you leave us with um, for, for that particular issue? Because it is a real problem. Mm -hmm. And then if I can ask, 
also uh, extend that to words of wisdom for students who are considering uh, attending an HBCU. Uh, Jan, you want to start? Oh, you go ahead. Okay. Um, I would say, because it's a multi-pronged question, so it's got lots of sides to it. Um, for those people who are looking at a school, I would, I would say invest a little time in looking at the faculty, see what kind of training that faculty has. Just because the school has a bigger name doesn't necessarily mean that the faculty is gonna actually hit you in your sweet spot. Mm -hmm. For black students who are gonna go come and study music, traditional Western harmony, just know that just because you're studying this kind of music, you're not gonna trade in your black card. You're not gonna to have to knock on the door to come home for Christmas. <laughs> you're gonna still be black. It's not gonna change you. Learning technique does not change who you are. Mm -hmm. If anything, coming to an HBCU is gonna actually ensure that you know who you are. Because Ooh, yes. by the time you leave, you're gonna know yourself so well. You're gonna learn your strengths. And more importantly, you're gonna understand your weaknesses. Not to give into them, but to understand them and know how not to let them limit you. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a good example. When I left Jackson State, I moved to St. Louis and went to grad school and took my first graduate theory course. And first class, everybody's pairing up and going off to these study groups. And I'm sitting there and nobody said a word to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're taking set theory, which is where you're taking integers, you're taking the pitches and changing them into numbers and you're working with these sets and subsets and aggregates Ooh. and all that kind of stuff. Okay, <laughs> fine. Got the first test back, I made the only A. What they didn't know is that I had been doing set theory since I was 17 in high school, but nobody bothered to ask. Right. And therefore I didn't bother to volunteer. And so then I got all these invitations <laughs> to study groups and I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't do study groups. <laughs> You know, my thing was but see, I, that's what happens when you happens. when you when you group oh, off and you right. group off and you and you make assumptions. Assumptions, yeah. Then you come up short. Yeah. And so my thing was always when I went to college, my first thought was I want to be a good musician, mm -hmm. whatever that means. And I was willing to listen to my teachers and learn from them. And for those students who were going to go off and into grad programs or into a uh, internships or apprenticeships and they're going to try to get into some of these are the one thing that you have to be keep in mind is make sure you understand who you are mm -hmm. so that you don't get that perception twisted and also don't expend all your energy looking to be offended mm -hmm. and here's why you're going to end up missing something really important if you are just looking for every microaggression there are too many that don't deserve your energy so don't give in to all that. Focus on your bigger picture. What did you come here for? Ooh. Make sure you leave with it. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my two cents. <laughs> and I will co-sign on it. And I will just add, uh, <clears throat> I think it is, it is certainly important uh, for any student going to any college, but, but particularly when you're considering HBCUs, I mean, we are not a one, just like there are many types of PWIs, there are many types of HBCUs. So you should look for a teacher, a program, the environment uh, that is best suited for you. And you should take it seriously. You know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of students may or may not have parents or even counselors who can guide them in that way. Uh, and so if I can just say, you know, it, you know, on this platform that students should really take that seriously, just because, um, you know, somebody in your family went to this particular HBCU, there are others across the country that have wonderful programs and one that is suited for you. So students uh, who come to PV, when we audition them and interview them, we really talk to them about what it is that they're looking for. Yeah. Um, you and know, what do you and I yeah, what do you what do you want to do? And how, and we work we really work toward getting them focused. We talk to them about their interests. For instance, you know, there's a student who graduated a few years ago that that just had an epiphany that he wanted to be an orchestral conductor. We don't have an orchestral uh, program, but we dug in there between all of us 
we got him prepared. And he's now at a major, um, you know, conservatory, uh, working on a graduate degree in orchestral conducting. Mm -hmm. And we've got story after story like that. Right, mm -hmm. Glow? Yeah. And uh, yeah. And so, you know, those are the types of things that you can expect from an HBCU. Yeah. And uh, for any student, and then the same with uh, p with graduate, uh, larger graduate programs as they recruit graduate students, they should look at these, you know, don't turn uh, an eye away from HBCUs. There's some marvelous things going on in, in our programs. And there certainly is at Prairie View. We can vouch for that. Mm -hmm. I can vouch yeah. for that, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and, and I would say to arts organizations, the same goes for you when you're looking to recruit and yeah. hire, um, um, whether it's admin, um, young artists, yeah. uh, orchestra auditions, whatever it is, you know, backstage crew, all of that. Yeah. It's and the same I, goes. Yeah. And at Prairie View, when we talk about the experience of our, our professors, I was an assistant mm -hmm. um, choral conductor for the Houston Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. So I've got that kind of experience and background exposure to those world-class conductors. So don't discount HBCUs and don't discount the backgrounds and the professional experiences of the professors who teach in, in mm -hmm. these programs. Mm -hmm. and that is one thing that I always appreciated in that so many of the professors, everybody actually um, within the music and theater department were also performing artists doing their craft. So it was not just theory based. It wasn't just these, oh, I read about this. It's like, no, we have class and tonight we have a performance and I'll see you at the performance <laughs> because I have to go do this. Um, I need some people to seek for this piece, for this workshop, who wants to do it? So you get that very real, very rich experience of what it's like to actually make the art. You don't spend all of your mm -hmm. time trying to be beaten into a mold or into some form or into some assumption of what it means to create art. You spend your time creating the art, or I did, right? We do it at Prairie View. And as Dr. The fact that we spend a lot of time outside of our regular schedule. Yeah. I'm, Dr. Taylor, how many times have we gone home and we left when the sun was coming up and we got home and the moon was up? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And Saturdays and occasional Sundays too, whatever whatever's needed because that's what needs to be done. Yes, yes. And our, we send our students out on professional jobs too. Yeah, yeah. our students have ex experience, uh, you know, gigging with uh, yes. all of the organizations around the city. Yeah, so. But the, the personal touch is one of those things that I think really sets us apart yes. because nowhere else will you go to school and you'll have not one, not two, not three, but five professors that will come up to you and tell you, okay, you know you're about to graduate, but you sound like you've never stepped foot in an English class before in your life. Your verbs and your subjects don't agree. You are not going to get hired talking like you just left whatever. Mm -hmm. Listen, get in here and let's, let's read this. Let's practice. You know how to do this. You're just making a choice not to do it. Now, right. And then you run into them later when they've got their students with them and you hear all of this beautiful English flowing out of their mouths, and you're like, who are you? <laughs> what did you do with the old you? And they, they'll tell you, I needed a job, and you were right. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and so those kind of things are really important because we're, this is like extended family. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. In absolutely. fact, we have a sophomore here who's here this year. And last year, I met her mother and her grandmother. And I took one look at them and I said, Ann. And the girl looked at me and she said, because oh, I was talking to her grandmother. But what she didn't realize is that when I was a grad student, I used to work at a church where her grandmother was one of the financial secretaries. <laughs> so the connections can go way back and they come rushing forward. Yeah. We had another graduate. I did a show with her grandmother 20 plus mm -hmm. years ago. Those things just kind of happen. And so uh, you know, call me. Let me know if she's getting out of hand. <laughs> that too. But we get that, and you know, and and it's not not that it's necessarily expected, but they know that they can trust us because we are here to make sure they came to get what they got, what they came here for. Yes. yes. And if you're not living up to your potential, we're gonna call you on it. Yes. In ways varied and interesting. 
because we're not allowed. We'll, we'll, we'll break a few verbs if we need to to make our point. Because <laughs> we we know how to do that if we need to. We haven't traded on our cards. <laughs> Absolutely, and then just the no, versatility um, yeah, was, coming out of those spaces. Yeah. In that, as Dr. Taylor said, yeah, you gig, and in those gigs that may be with um, with. HGO, right? That may be with another like classical quotation marks organization, but at the same time, people still have the church gigs and they still have the performances mm -hmm. at night. They still have all these other things. So there are so many well-rounded musicians who know how to do more than one thing <laughs> yes. and do them all well that come out of the spaces because of the additional culture that comes into who you are and how you bring yourself to this work as opposed to this is who you have to be. So yeah, this is, this is, uh, this has been fantastic, y'all. Thank you so much uh, for this. Um, this is around, around the time we go to um, uh, quote with positive notes. And honestly, I feel like the whole show has been nothing but fantastic and positive notes. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for the invite. This has been fun for us. Absolutely. Yeah. Really, really. Um, honored and it's a pleasure to be here to be a part of this thank, thank you. you so much oh, y'all are awesome my positive notes as you can see when there is sincerity in the work that is being done mm -hmm. and when you handle your business as well um there is a, a connection lifelong connections that happen and as we do our work in the arts, we wanna be mindful that we have the opportunity to foster such connections, but it requires that we also mm -hmm. have the humility to extend those connections beyond our own assumptions. And then that we have the humility to take up space in certain ways and then to hold space for others so that we do get to experience what it is like to be in a space where you are valued, where you are loved, where you are supported, where you are challenged, of course, and then where you have the opportunity to do so for those around you and for those to follow. So with this, my positive notes include making sure that we are centering connection, that we're centering truth, that we are getting rid of our assumptions, and that we are also paying attention to the amazing work that's coming out of so many of the HBCUs in our nation, as well as the amazing work that's coming out of so many of our different communities. And of course, once we start to center that connection and once we start to center this work, we know that it's contagious. We know that it continues and we know that we don't have to do it alone. So with that, those are my positive notes for this awesome episode with my awesome PV professors <laughs> and family. So yeah, we um, thank you again um, for being here and a shout out to Dr. Selden who did have to run um, and, and do her job. Um, <laughs> had to go to work. Um, so we completely appreciate it um, very much. So we thank you all for tuning in. Please folks, be bold, be creative, be innovative. Think outside the box. Think about HBCUs. Listen to these people, okay? <laughs> all right, there was a lot of wisdom and a lot, a lot, of, a lot of knowledge spread here today. So please, we um, thank you for joining us and we will see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye.